Good morning. I hope everybody's doing great. <clears throat> uh, we've spent the last two Sundays talking about events and terminology for the end times. And today we get back into Bible specific stuff and we're going to start the book of Daniel. We'll do a little bit of an overview and get into chapter one before we uh, finish off today's lesson. I uh, hope you're engaged in this. I think it's uh, it's pretty exciting. I'm looking forward to uh, this continuing study. Before we get started, let's bow our heads. Our Lord, thank you for um, the opportunity to get together to study your word. May it be meaningful in our lives, improve our faith, and help us to relate better to other people. Be with each and every one of us today. In thy name we pray. Amen. Well, people are endlessly fascinated by Bible prophecy. Uh, the prophecies of Daniel and the book of Revelation have been sensationalized in best-selling books and movies. Uh, people want to know what the future holds, but there's a big difference between Bible prophecy and fortune telling. Bible prophecy is serious business. God did not send visions to Daniel or to John uh, or to Ezekiel just to provide entertainment. God gave us the books of those authors, uh, Daniel and Revelation specifically, as well as other books of the Bible to unfold his program of history. He gave us uh, these books meant to not only inform us of the future, but to instruct us in the present. God gave us these books so that we would know how to live now and today and tomorrow um, with the future in mind. Uh, Daniel and Revelation's prophecies have not yet been fulfilled. Uh, these two books, one in the Old Testament and one in the New Testament, uh, markedly complement one another in, in their symmetry and in their harmony. The book of Revelation explains the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel provides the basis for the book of Revelation. Uh, to know God's plan for the future, one must first understand Daniel. That's why we're starting there. Uh, God doesn't unfold the future to us in specific detail. He doesn't tell us uh, about our individual futures, yours or mine. What he does do is he tells us the general trend of events, the outline of his plan, and the way his program is sure to end. And we know that uh, when God says it's going to end this way, we should trust because God has been trustworthy throughout the, throughout the scriptures and in our lives. Uh, but because of man's free will, we still have a choice. And man often redirects history, but he never really can succeed in stopping God's ultimate will. Everything that happens on earth is working out God's plan and his purpose. Uh, we can understand the present only in light of God's prophetic plan. And that's why we're studying this today. And that's why our faith today is so important in understanding what God's plan is for tomorrow. Now, God has taken two precautions uh, in his unveiling of the future. He has closed his prophetic passages in symbolic language. Uh, we read them figuratively. That's why we see such strange and frightening images in Daniel and Revelation. Uh, startling signs in nature strange beast with different heads and horns sticking out, uh, images of shattering worldwide consequences. Uh, you cannot understand without knowing a great deal about the rest of the Bible. Uh, the future is hidden from us until we spend time understanding the signs. So let's take a simple sign. Uh, we read before and we will read again uh, about horns. Uh, there are horns on the altar. Uh, we talk about horns of power. Uh, we talk about horns of refuge. 
And so let's, let's just pursue that just a little bit so that in understanding what the rest of the Bible has to say about horns, when it comes up in Daniel and in Revelation, we will understand what the symbology is. So let's start in Exodus chapter 27, verses 1 through 2. God says, make the altar of burnt offering from Arcadia wood. So he's talking to uh, Abraham about building the altar. It should be in, the altar in, in the tabernacle. It should be square and measure seven and a half feet by seven and a half feet. Make it four and a half feet high. Construct it with horns on each side of the four corners so that the top forms one whole piece and overlay it with bronze. So here we get our first indication. Now, why in the world would we put horns on an altar? Well, horns are symbol of help and refuge and power. And we can see that as we read through the scriptures. So let's go next to the book of Deuteronomy. Um, in this case, verse 30, uh, chapter 33, verse 17. His, he is majestic, like a firstborn bull. He has powerful horns, as does a wild ox. With them, he will gore the nations, driving them away to the ends of the earth. This is the power of Ephraim's ten thousands of Manasseh's troops, of thousands of troops. So he's talking about the Lord and power, and he refers to a bull with horns. Um, so we're talking about strength there. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 1, uh, verse 49 and 51. All those attending Ad Adonijah's gathering were frightened by this news. They had gathered their things and departed. Even Adonijah was completely terrified of Solomon. So remember, uh, Adonijah was uh, David's son who tried to take the throne from Solomon. David had designated Solomon, and God had designated Solomon to be his relief. Even uh, he stood up and rushed to the altar, seeking sanctuary. He grabbed hold of the horns, expecting Solomon to spare his life, as was the custom. So here we have horns that were built in the first altar for the tabernacle. We have God described as uh, the horns of a bull of strength. Uh, here we have Adonijah, uh, who is uh, being pursued by Solomon for trying to usurp illegally the throne. And he runs to the altar and he seeks refuge by grabbing the horns. So here, horns could indicate refuge. Uh, and lastly, let's go to the book of Revelation, chapter 5, verses uh, 1 through 6. And then I saw a scroll in the right hand of the one seated upon the throne, a scroll written both inside and on the outside. It had been sealed with seven seals. Then a mighty messenger proclaimed with a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? No creature of creation in all heaven and on earth or even under the earth, could open the scroll or look into its mysteries. Then I began to mourn and weep bitterly, because no creature of creation was found who was worthy to open the scroll or to look into its mysteries. Then one of the elders consoled me. One of the elders said, Stop weeping. Look there, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. He has conquered and is able to break into its seven seals and open the scroll. I looked. And between the throne and the four living creatures and the 24 elders stood a lamb who appeared to have been slaughtered, obviously the Messiah. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes. The eyes are the seven spirits of God sent over out all the earth. So here is a lamb with seven horns. Now what did the seven horns represent? Strange symbol. But we know from other verses in the Bible that horns are symbols of strength and power and refuge. All of those terms apply equally to the Savior. 
The second precaution that God takes in unveiling his plan is he doesn't introduce the prophetic message or the prophetic section first. He first introduces elements of faith. This is especially true in Daniel and the Revelations. He brings us through chapters of moral teaching. He wants to lead us into an understanding of what a moral character is. He requires us uh, before the prophetic message uh, that we learn about what, what God wants before we can actually understand and investigate the prophetic message. And then you have, uh, you have to incorporate because you, you learn the moral lessons first and then you have to incorporate these lessons into your life. And if you don't understand or incorporate these spiritual lessons into your life, you'll find nothing in the prophetic messages to enrich your lives. Um, Jesus warned his disciples, don't read through the prophetic messages carelessly or superficially. You must grasp the full import of the scriptures if you are to recognize the final desolation when it comes. And we talked about tribulation and the final battles in the previous Sundays. And this is what Christ has been about to explain to the disciples in very vague terms. But listen to what he says. I'm in Matthew 24. And he warns them. Uh, Jesus left the temple. As he was walking away, his disciples came up to him and asked him what he thought about the temple buildings. Look around you, Jesus said. All of you will, all of it will become rubble. I tell you this, not one stone will be left standing. Later, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. The disciples said, we don't understand your predictions. Tell us, when will these things happen? When will the temple be destroyed? What will be the sign that you are returning? How will we know that the end of the age is upon us? So they're asking Christ the same questions we ask. How do you know when history ends? Um, in this last of Jesus' uh, major sermons, he focuses on prophetic and apocalyptic times and themes and of judgment and end times. Uh, the disciples have been listening to the prophetic judgment Jesus had issued on the religious leaders, and they had images of collapsing temples and prophets going from town to town, of floggings and of blood-soaked garments, things that they would have expected at the end times. So listen to what Christ responds, how he responds to the question. He says, take care that you will not be deceived. Uh, the NI version says, watch out. Uh, for many of Many will come in my name, claiming that they are the anointed one, and many poor souls will be taken in. You will hear of wars, and you will hear rumors of wars, and you, will, you should not panic. It is inevitable, this violent breaking apart of the sinful world, but remember, the wars are not the end. The end is still unfolding. Nations will do battle with nations, and kingdoms will fight neighboring kingdoms, and there will be famines and earthquakes. But these are not the end. These are the birth pangs, the beginning the end is still unfolding, and it's still unfolding today. So he makes the same um, point again in the same chapter when he references the story of the great flood in Noah's day. The people of Noah's day um, were um, distressed because they were in ignorance. They didn't know what was happening, but Noah did because he knew the Lord. And so in verse 36, this continues. Um, 36 through 41. No one knows the hour or the day, not even the messengers in heaven, not even the Son. Only the Father knows, as it was in the time of Noah, so it will be with the coming of the Son of Man. In the days before the flood, people were busy making lives for themselves. They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage making plans and having children and growing old until the day Noah entered the ark. Those people had no idea what was coming. They knew nothing about the floods until the floods were on them, sweeping them away. That is why, how it would be with the coming of the Son of Man, so Jesus' coming. Two men will be plowing the field. One will be taken. The other will be left in the field. Two women will be somewhere girding, uh, grinding at a mill, 
at a mill. One will be taken and the other will be left at the mill. So Christ says, um, the people who are knowledgeable of God and who seek to live a godly life will become more aware of the uh, prophetic message and understand it and, and look forward to it where other people will be ignorant and they, they won't know what's happening. Um, so let's talk about the book of Daniel. Uh, Daniel easily divides into two sections. The first six chapters are devoted to moral and spiritual instructions, just as the first couple chapters of Revelation are are constructed the same way. And John, when he took the took the uh, was shown the visions, he talked to the seven churches of uh, ancient um, uh, Turkey. Um, so we'll review um, these stories of Daniel in the first six chapters over a couple Sundays. Uh, what it is is the history of Daniel and his friends, teenagers, uh, when they were exiled to Babylon in 605 B.C. by King Nebuchadnezzar. It's a story of faith lived out in the fiery crucible of a hostile world. This is the story of teenagers living a life of faith amid the pressures, hostility, temptation, and persecution in a pagan world. This is really no different than our living today, trying to live a Christian life in a non-Christian world. Uh, chapters 7 through 12 of Daniel are the future-based section of Daniel, and we'll get to those uh, in a couple Sundays. So let's talk about the background of Daniel. We usually talk about that to understand the book a little bit more each time we get into a new book. Uh, the author, uh, the first person accounts in Daniel say Daniel was the author, uh, that he wrote the book. Scholars disagree about who actually wrote the book and whether Daniel was an historical figure of the times or just a fictional story written by someone using Daniel's name. Uh, for our purposes, we will speak of Daniel as being historical. At the heart of this issue is the question of when was the book written? Uh, objective evidence says that the book was probably completed about 530 B.C., shortly after Babylon was conquered by the Persians and King Cyrus in 539 B.C. This is important. The, the date of the book, when it was written, if it was written after after these prophetic messages that will, that are described in 7 through 12, then it's not really prophetic. But even if you consider that it's written late in the 2nd century B.C., there are still elements of the prophetic message that become true. And so we're looking to see whether or not we can count on the ultimate prophetic message of the end times as being true. Um, so if Daniel is seen as a work completed during the exile, then it's more truly prophetic. The theological theme is God's sovereignty. Uh, Daniel's visions always show that God is triumphant. <clears throat> the climax to Daniel's description of God's sovereignty is actually found in the book of Revelations. And so there are two companion uh, sentences about God's final kingdom, one in Daniel and one in Revelations, and that shows a little bit of the linkage between the two. So to begin with, I'm going to go to Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, and this is Daniel's description of the end times and the kingdom that God intends to establish here on earth when uh, everything is over. In the days when these kings of iron and clay reign, the God of, king, of heaven will set up another kingdom, a kingdom that can never be destroyed, a kingdom that will never be ruled by others. It will crush all the other kingdoms and bring them to an end. This kingdom will last forever. And if we go to the book of Revelation, in chapter 11, we get a similar description. Um, 11 verse... 15. And these are voices from heaven. 
in the throne room. It says, the kingdom of the world has given away to the kingdom of the Lord and of his anointed one. He will reign throughout the ages. When the seventh messenger in this story uh, blows his trumpet, the kingdom of the world will come to an end, as described by these messengers, and the rule and reign of God and Jesus will arrive and reign forever. So that's an example of the linkage between the two and the theological scene, theme of both that says God is supreme and God will reign forever. The literary form, how the book is written and what format it is, whether it's poetry or historical, um, in Daniel, the first six chapters are, are an historical narrative. It's about Daniel, his friends, and what happens to them in Babylon. Uh, <clears throat> but the uh, chapters 7 through 12 are apocalyptic in nature or relevatory. In other words, uh, they foretell a prophecy of things that are about to happen. So as we've discussed about apoc we've discussed apocalyptic literature before. So as a brief uh, summary, remember that apocalyptic literature is defined as symbolic. It's visionary. It's prophetic. It's usually composed during a time of oppressive conditions to the church, and it's chiefly eschatological in theological content. So there's another there's another word, a strange word, es Eschatological means um, it relates to death, judgment, and the final destiny of the soul and of mankind, and it's the end times. So eschatological theology is about the end times, which we are in the process of studying now and will for the next several months. Apocalyptic literature, you remember, is primarily a literature of encouragement to people of God. Um, it was encouragement in the book of Ezekiel, the few apocalyptic chapters that were in there. And we'll find that it's encouraging to the people of Daniel in exile. And it's encouraging to us, people of the future, as Revelation provides it to us. And as stated earlier, its true meaning is hidden by strange symbols. Uh, symbolic numbers, strange beasts, horns, and its true meaning is hidden to those who are not familiar with God's word and or who treat the story superficially without study. And so to better understand uh, these books, we need to understand God's meaning in the Bible, and we've been doing that for years now. Our plan is to conduct an overview study of the first six chapters of Daniel. That's what I'm going to do first. And a more in-depth look at the individual chapters, uh, the apocalyptic section in chapters 7 through 12. So let's talk about chapter 1. Uh, in chapter 1, we're introduced to uh, three young, four young men, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now, you probably find their Babylonian names more familiar to you. They are Belteshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, these teenagers uh, were pressured to give up in, in chapter 1 their kosher diet and not eat the very foods that the Babylonians required of the prisoners to eat. And so I'm in Daniel chapter 1. Uh, first seven verses. Now it happened during the reign of King Jehoiakim's reign over Judah. That's in 605 B.C. The armies of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon marched against him and laid siege to Jerusalem, Judah's capital. The Lord gave Nebuchadnezzar the victory and allowed him to take King Jehoiakim of Judah as his prisoner. At the same time, he permitted a Babylonian king to rob God's temple of some of its sacred vessels and carry them away to Babylon, which was the land between the Tigris and Euphrates River, to fill the treasury of his own gods, Marduk and Nebo. After the king returned home, he commanded Ashpenaz, chief royal eunuch, to bring some of the Israelites who had been taken captive to the palace. These included members of Judah's royal family and nobility. 
He was looking for potential candidates from the exiles to serve in his court, fit young men with no physical or moral infirmaries, handsome, skilled in all knowledge, knowledgeable, discerning, and understanding. <coughs> Those selected would be taught the language and literature of the Chaldeans, the people who lived in Babylon. <coughs> As part of their assimilation into the Babylonian court, the king offered them a daily portion of food and wine from his own table. They were to be educated for three years before serving the king's court. From among Judah's exiles, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were selected. Ashapez, chief of the royal eunuchs, gave them Babylonian names to signify their new identities in a foreign place. Daniel, he renamed Belshazzar, Hananiah, Shadrach, Mishael, Mish Meshach, and Azariah, Abednego. So, <clears throat> Um, quickly into the, Daniel, the author establishes the motivating force behind the story. God, who is at work, which we see throughout the book. And so I go back to verses 8 and 9. Although the king ate only the finest Babylonian fare, Daniel was determined not to violate God's law and defile himself by eating the food and drinking the wine that came from the king's table. So he asked the chief of the royal eunuchs for permission not to eat the food. They didn't want to eat the food because the food had been offered up to pagan idols and it didn't meet the dietary laws. It was full of blood. Now God had given Daniel special favor and fondness in the eyes of the king's chief eunuch. So God is working his magic. Um, what happens then is Daniel proposes... Um, a plan. Now these uh, young men, these four men, were superior in everything. It would have been an honor to be trained as officers in the king's palace. Uh, the purpose of the three-year training course was to transform the Jews into Babylonians. A new land, uh, new names, uh, new customs, new ideas, new language, uh, Practicing customs contrary to the laws of Moses obviously became problematic. While some thought that the Babylonians' victory at Jerusalem looked like a victory for idols, uh, God was showing these young men that their Jewish faith was superior uh, to, their, to the pagan faith of their uh, victors, their captors. Uh, the king's food was the best in the land, but these Hebrew students would refuse it. The food was filled with blood and it had been offered to idols. The four Jewish students didn't threaten anyone. They didn't stage a protest. They didn't burn down a building. They just simply asked their master to agree to a plan, a test, allow them to eat the foods of their choice and compare the results after 10 days. Um, and so what they did was they said, let us uh, be vegetarians. Give us uh, vegetables and water, and then after 10 days, look at us versus the other, uh, the other young men who are eating the normal fare and see who uh, looks and is the best. And if we go to uh, Daniel, um, later chapters and verses, it says... Um, when the ten days were up, he looked at them, he looked over, and noticed that Daniel and his friends were better off than all the young men eating from the king's best foods. They looked healthy and well-nourished, so the guard continued to hold back their royal rations and replaced them with strictly vegetable. Through all of this, God conferred upon these four young men superior abilities in literature, language, and wisdom. God had given Daniel an additional gift, too the ability to interpret visions and dreams. When the three-year period of training and conditioning as set by the king was over, the king sent for the candidates. The chief of the royal eunuchs himself escorted them to Nebuchadnezzar. This is how Daniel came to serve the royal court, a position he safely held until the first year of King Cyrus when the Persian army conquered Babylon. Daniel was in government service for over 60 years, much longer than many of us, including me, can say. And he did it in a foreign land, in a foreign country, that, that did not uh, adhere to his beliefs. 
Now, each believer um, is either a conformer or a transformer. Uh, we're either squeezed into the world's mold or we're transforming things in the world. Not every faithful servant is given the blessing of a long life like Daniel. He lived, we estimate, 83 years. But Daniel's life was hardly a breeze. He had many challenges to his faith, um, the way he envisioned things. But nonetheless, his life gave readers encouragement of God's sovereignty. And as I hope, as we get into these stories, it will encourage us too uh, as we study Daniel. It's a, it's a great lesson, and I look forward to uh, next Sunday. We'll quickly skim over many of the stories that you've heard about the lion's den and the fiery furnace and the strange statues and the reading of dreams. Uh, we'll go over and uh, we'll get through chapters 2 through 6 next Sunday. So I hope you'll tune in. Let's close with a word of prayer. Lord God, thank you for being with us here this morning. Bless each and every one of us in our study. May we learn the passages and the messages of the Bible and understand that God is indeed sovereign so that when we come to interpreting the prophetic messages of Daniel and Revelations, we'll be better informed and can understand God's plan for us and God's plan for mankind at the end of all time. Please be with each and every one of us and bring us back safely again next Sunday. In thy name we pray. Amen. Have a great week.